A very warm welcome to this event at the Lockdown Lit Fest, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. We hope you're well, we hope you're safe, and we hope you're keeping careful. And a quick shout out for those of you loyal followers who have been with us for the three, four months they now have of our existence, perhaps we can ask a request. It would be really helpful, and we would love it if you would, one, visit the website, www.lockdownlitfest.com, and sign up for the newsletter. It's quick, simple, painless, and what's even better, it's free. And if you're following us on YouTube, just a little button below the screen is a subscribe button. If you'd like to hit that for us, that would be most helpful too. It allows us to keep up, you up to date with all that we are doing. As many of you will be aware, we've recently entered into a partnership with a wonderful initiative called the Boxer Diversity Initiative. Based out of Sarasota in Florida, in the United States of America, they, we have tapped into a one wonderful resource they have of fantastic authors, writers, thinkers, and speakers. And today is no exception. Timothy Patrick McCarthy is a lecturer on history and literature and on public policy at Harvard University. He's an award-winning scholar, an educator, public servant, and social justice activist who's taught at Harvard's faculty since 2005. He holds a joint appointment in the undergraduate honors program in history and literature, Graduate School of Education and the John F. Kennedy School of Government, where he is core faculty at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. He's also the Stanley Patterson Professor of American History at the Boston Clemente Course, a college humanities course for low-income adults, and he's the co-recipient of the 2015 National Humanities Medal. It will therefore come as no surprise to any of you that he's twice been named one of Harvard Crimson's Professors of the Year. He's the recipient of many awards for his commitment to students, including the 2019 Manuel C. Caraballo Award for Excellence in Teaching, the Kennedy School's highest teaching honor, which allows me to say, Professor Timothy Patrick McCarthy, a very warm welcome to the Lockdown Lit Fest. Thank you so much for joining us. Just to start us off, tell us where in the world are you? Well, where in the world am I? I'm at home in my apartment in Quincy House at Harvard University one of Harvard's residential colleges, where I've been uh, on lockdown and in quarantine since uh, March 16th. <laughs> How's it going? Are you well? Are you safe? Are you being careful? Yes, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm fortunate I have what I need, and we're, we're safe and healthy and uh, just trying to hold up during these crazy times. <laughs> these are indeed crazy times. I know that you're a frequent media commentator, that you've, you're right, you've written everything from Salon, the Boston Globe, Huffington Post, Daily Beast, Panjairus, and The Nation, uh, and that you were guest editor for the nation's historic Reclaiming Stonewall 50 Forum. I also know that you were shaped by anti-apartheid and AIDS activism in your college years. If I may be permitted, what I'd like to do is a voyage around what has formed the professor that is an inspiration to so many students, as I've outlined in my introduction. So could I talk about the, the young, Timothy Patrick McCarthy? Where did you spring from? And that thing that I'm always so fascinated by, Tim, that trigger point, that hinge point in a person's life where they realize we're only here one time, this experience of humanity is interesting, endlessly fascinating, but we have to commit to something to which we are passionate. Oh, which we are passionate about. Can you talk us through that, that hinge point in your life? Yeah. So I think that there are um, two things I want to say about that. The first is that I come from a family that is deeply rooted in public service values and social justice values. I was raised in a a uh, home with two parents who were public school teachers in New York State. Uh, I was raised by four grandparents from immigrant stock. My grandmother was a trailblazing educator, the first in our family to go to college. My great grandfather said that school was unnecessary for girls, and she was the oldest of 16 uh, immigrant children. And she ran away from home, got a college degree, moved to New York, and became a public school teacher. And uh, union uh, teacher and, and, and department chair. Um, and she and my parents and my other grandparents who were factory workers um, helped to raise me and instill in me both a deep respect for the dignity of all work, no matter how extractive or exploitative, uh, and also a deep valuing of education as the thing that my family at least really felt could open doors of opportunity 
um, that some of them had experienced, but not all of them had experienced. So I came from that home, a social justice Catholic home, a working class home, um, and a home that valued education. And so when I graduated from high school um, in the spring of 1989, I, in some ways, was set flowing into a world historical moment. When I graduated from high school in June of 1989, the tanks rolled into Tiananmen Square. When I got to college in the fall of my first year in 1989, the wall was torn down in Berlin. Um, In the fall of my uh, uh, sophomore year, um, the uh, Soviet Union dissolved in Moscow. In the spring of my sophomore year, Nelson Mandela walked out of prison. In the fall of my junior year, America went to war in Iraq. At the end of my junior year, the rebellions and riots broke out in Los Angeles. And then the fall of my senior year, Bill Clinton was elected, ending 12 years of the long Reagan and Bush era. So I came of age in a moment already rooted in values of justice and service um, when the world was changing. Those were revolutionary, world historical, tumultuous times. And I happened to be in college at a time when at Harvard, at least, there was a renaissance in African-American studies. And so I was studying history and literature and African-American studies at the same time that the world was changing rapidly and profoundly. And that was a kind of inflection point for me. It was convergence of many things. Clearly, I had the values that were already deep in my roots, uh, but they were able to flourish and to soar, really, when I was in college in that moment. And that really set me flowing. And it's been a life, really, of commitment to service and social justice, to academic life, to the life of the mind. Um, And all of those things have been part of what's made me who I am. Well, you're hiding part of your light under a bushel, I have to say, because to to add to those many skills that you've just outlined, all of which are a, a, a very fair analysis of what you've done, is the very powerful mode of communication and power of communication that you have to express the things you see and the things that you think about. Um, To my research, you first sort of put pen to paper and got published um, with uh, The Radical Reader back in 2003, a documentary history of the American radical tradition. Can you talk us through what it meant to you to be able to express what you'd learned, what you were seeing, and to be able to put it in ink on paper? Well, it's interesting because when I was coming up as a student, um, you know, we had these master narratives of the nation, which were always focused on the most privileged people, presidents and captains of industry and generals in the military and people who were really elites. And I always um, was uncomfortable at that, in part because I was raised by teachers who were always asking what I Uh, what questions I had. I was raised in a home where I was taught to be a critical thinker from the very get-go. My grandmother on the weekends when I was a little boy would always sit with me at the playground or out in the backyard and she would say, what did you learn in school this week? And then she would ask me, what did you learn in school this week that you have questions about? Oh, nice. That you don't accept. And she was asking me that from the time I was in five, six, seven years old. So I was raised that way. And so when I got to college and I realized that you could study history in all of these different ways, I started taking, in particular, African-American history classes, where I started to realize that all of this history that I was now studying was left out of the history books that I had been brought up on. And so I started to think, okay, if we start to pay attention to the people who have been left out of those master narratives, not just African Americans throughout American history, but the laborers and the workers and the women and the LGBT people and the people who are on the sort of downside of discrimination and oppression and so forth, but also these people who have formed this radical tradition that I've spent much of my life studying and teaching and writing about, um, this tradition of dissent, this tradition of of speaking truth to power, being critical thinkers and doers in the nation, um, that was what drew me to that history. And so when I was in graduate school, I I studied in graduate school with Eric Foner, um, the very famous Civil War and Reconstruction historian, also a historian of radicalism, the late, great Manning Marable, who was a leading scholar of African-American history, History. And then later on with Martin Duberman and, and Howard Zinn, two of the great radical historians of the LGBTQ 
LGBTQ movement on the one hand, uh, and then of uh, the radical tradition and social movements on the other hand. And so together, these four mentors really instilled in me and inspired in me a desire to really tell a different story about America a story that was much more small d democratic, much, much more multicultural, much, much more inclusive, and a story where conflict and dissent and struggle and organizing becomes the lifeblood of American democracy. And so when I had an opportunity in graduate school um, to publish this book, it was, it was at the time the first ever documentary history of American radicalism that had ever been published. And it was inspired in, in some way by the work of all of those scholars. And then my colleague, John McMillan, who was a fellow graduate student with me at Columbia at the time in New York, um, we had the opportunity to publish that book with the New Press, which was a relatively, um, a, a press that had just been founded about a, a decade before as a kind of social justice press. So it was a remarkable opportunity and that too kind of set me flowing. And now that book for, you know, almost almost two decades now, which is uh, insane to think about, um, the 20th anniversary of that publication will be in a couple of years. Um, that book has become a, a textbook of sort, a primary document textbook um, that's been taught in, in courses all over the country and, and actually throughout the world. It sort of begs the question now, Tim, where is the radical tradition in America that we see right here, right now? Oh my gosh, we're having a renaissance of radicalism in the United States right now. This is, I, I think, you know, historians always have to take some time to make sense of whatever unfolds. But, uh, but we're experiencing right now uh, a profound moment of radical resurgence in the country. Um, I think principally rooted in and led by the Black Lives Matter movement, which is the 21st century manifestation of a long black freedom struggle that dates back to the first enslaved people being brought to the, 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 the land of North America against their will. Um, the black freedom struggle is one of the central engines of American democracy, um, where you have, you know, dating back to the early forms of resistance of enslaved people against slavery and their masters, the free black communities that that formed the abolitionist movement, the, um, the, the fugitive slaves and the slave rebels who were testing in more uh, aggressive and powerful ways the institution of slavery, the, all of the activists during the Reconstruction era, the black elected office holders all the way on down to the present day. And so the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which is really forcing and forging a racial reckoning in the United States right now, is that kind of modern inheritor of that long black freedom struggle. And so there's a, there's a, that's where it's rooted right now. But you also have all of these other expressions of radicalism in the 21st century. You have the great movements to oppose the uh, wars on Afghanistan and Iraq early on in the century. You have the Occupy movement, which uh, was very important, relatively short-lived in terms of its time span, but profoundly important in terms of the language it gave us and the critique of capitalism that it gave us, the language of the 1% and the 99% of Main Street and Wall Street, the rise of Bernie Sanders as a viable president presidential candidate in two election cycles. Much of that was, uh, the groundwork for that was laid by the Occupy movement. You have the women's movement, which has experienced a kind of resurgence, not only in the, the powerful presence of, of African-American women and other women of color, queer women of color, who are at the core of the Black Lives Matter movement, of indigenous rights movements, of the, uh, the Dreamer movement and the, the immigration rights movement. And of course, you have the LGBTQ movement which over the last two decades has um, experienced an enormous amount of progress, particularly under uh, the presidency of Barack Obama, who I would argue will probably go down in history as the LBJ of the LGBTQ movement. Um, and he himself and his presidency um, is something that has been historic and has inspired new ways of thinking about multiculturalism and democracy and the possibility of politics. So I think, you know, everywhere you turn in America right now, you have uh, expressions of radicalism, whether it's labor radicalism or, or the radicalism of African Americans and people of color, queer people, women, etc. Uh, again, a kind of renaissance. That said, we are also experiencing in this um, century uh, deep forms of repression, renewed forms of authoritarianism. 
um, uh, uh, different kinds of oppression that certainly manifest themselves most um, obviously in the regime of the Trump administration, uh, which has brought into relief um, and, and, and illuminated in so many ways and inspired so many of the deep conflicts that are ancient in our culture, many of them, um, certainly the racism and the xenophobia that you see expressed um, in the president's tweets and in his speeches and actions every single day. Um, so there are, there are enemies all over the land. As I like to say, you know, we are struggling um, to embrace the better angels of our nature in a world where we have some of the worst devils of our nation. That's a very nice line, and we'll probably pull that out as a quote, if we may. Yeah. I have to take you back to something for our international audience who may not be terribly familiar mm. with, the, with the sedimentology or the, 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 the history of American presidents. Can you unpack for, for me that fantastic phrase you've just used? You perceive a, the Obama presidency, Barack Obama, as the LBJ of the LGBT. QT yes. president. So, you know, I, I should say, first of all, that I, I had the honor and privilege of working uh, on the 2008 uh, campaign of Barack Obama. I was a, a member of his National LGBT Leadership Council during his campaign that helped to um, shape some of his policy uh, positions and also ultimately the, the platform of the Democratic Party. Um, I uh, came to, I won't bore you with all the details of how I, how I got there, but um, I did, I was drawn into that campaign. And I'm not a, a political campaign person. I am by, by temperament uh, and, and other things, a lefty. Uh, I'm an outside politics guy. I'm not, I'm not an inside politics guy. I've never wanted to run for office. I've never wanted to be part of a bureaucracy. Uh, I've certainly supported candidates, given money to candidates, worked for candidates, but I'd never worked on a presidential campaign. Um, and there was something different about him, right, aside from the fact that he uh, ultimately became the first African-American president and was a, a quite a viable candidate from the, from, even from the beginning. But he was someone who, um, he was speaking a different way. He was talking in different ways about America. There was the hope and change promise and so forth. But one of the things that I was really struck by was how open-minded he was around, particularly around LGBT issues, in a way that had not been the case with any president previous to him. Um, and so he, I think, opened up, he was in some ways a portal, if not a vessel, for significant advances in the rights of LGBTQ people. And so when I say he's the LBJ of the LGBT movement, uh, what I mean by that is that LBJ, even though he was a complicated man, full of contradictions, the racist in some ways, he was also in some ways a portal, if not a vessel for the advancement of black civil rights, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act, the Great Society programs. Of course, LBJ's presidency, as we all know, uh, was wrecked and ruined, undone by the the the, the unjust war in Vietnam, um, and so that that was a deeply unfortunate uh, end to what promised to be and what was initially quite a spectacular transformative presidency after the tragic assassination of John F. Kennedy. So when I say that Barack Obama is the LBJ of the LGBT movement, I say that he was the ally in chief. He wasn't the leader of our movement, okay, but he was someone who, as I said become a portal, if not a vessel, to the advancement of rights. And I don't, I think it's, it's important to note that the first African-American president, a trailblazer himself, representative of so many advances in our society, was able to be that portal for other groups of people that, that he was not necessarily by identity or community uh, aligned with. You use the word leadership there, and it, it strikes a chord in me because, of course, so many nations, not least ours, are craving Good quality leadership, thought through leadership, inclusive leadership. Are you see, it's a question I asked actually of another Boxer Diversity Initiative uh, guest of ours earlier on this week, Michael, uh, Michael Jeffries. Yeah. I asked him, who are the leaders that he sees coming up who are, who are open minded with regard to Black Lives Matter, the people that can lead from the front, the people that can, that can be seen, and in, in, in the guys that if you, you cannot be what you cannot see? I'm asking the same question, I suppose, of you, Tim. Who are the leaders that you see in the movements that you're aware of who, who, are, who are prepared to be seen and who are leading from the front? What, I suppose yeah. what I'm really asking is what hope can you offer? Yeah, well, you 
started this interview by asking me about, you know, what, what had shaped me to become the professor I'd become or the person I'd become. And one thing I was thinking about was my students, yeah. the young people that I work with in all of these different contexts, um, really are the ones who keep shaping me and keep holding me accountable and keep inspiring me to stay true to who I am and to continue to, to, to live my life in a way that I hope has some kind of integrity and, and, and fire for justice and for freedom and these other things. And so the young folks are always where I go to look for leadership. It's a different way of thinking about leadership, just like the radical tradition is a different way of thinking about history. Yeah. To think about young people as the leaders, as opposed to you know the followers of the old folks who are well positioned and well healed, um, is a different way of thinking about history and about leadership. And so, when I look at the all of these young people in the street, black people, brown people, white people, people of all sorts of different backgrounds who are out there in the midst of a global pandemic who are out there in the streets demanding justice, racial justice, justice in policing, and all sorts of other realms, um, I'm inspired by that. They are brave. When I think about the, the, the young people, the high school students from Parkland and from other schools that have experienced uh, mass shootings and uh, gun violence, when I think about the way that they're leading on those issues, they're holding us to account. When I think about all of the young queer students that I've worked with over the years, some of them who are in deeply vulnerable situations, experiencing poverty or homelessness or racism or even uh, threats of uh, incarceration in some ways, all sorts of injustices, and yet still maintain their bravery. These young women who are coming forth in, in powerful ways to challenge patriarchy and misogyny and harassment and sexual violence. Um, when I look at all those young people um, who are out there in the streets, who are speaking up, speaking out, marching, making demands, holding us to account, challenging institutions, that's, that's where I see the future. I mean, people always ask me, like, why do you teach? And I, I, you know, I think I went into teaching because it was sort of in my blog. My family were so many teachers, um, and I had great professors and mentors. But when I think about it now, I'm almost 50. I'm about halfway done with my career. I've taught a generation of students. The reason I still teach is not because I love faculty meetings. <laughs> I still teach because these young people are the hope that I can see in the world. And every time I'm in spaces with them, whether they're classrooms, for virtually now on Zoom, out there in the streets together, doing things in the world. That's what gives me hope. And the other thing that gives me hope is something that um, is also part of that radical tradition are artists, people who are creative folks, the people who write music and perform music, who dance, who write plays, who, who act, who write poetry, who speak truth to power through literary form and visual culture and sculpture and all of these ways that the, the creative people who are often on the outside of power and privilege, always underfunded and underappreciated, are sometimes our greatest truth tellers. And so when I look for hope, in the future, the first places I go are to young people and to artists. And sometimes there's an overlap there. The, the young people are the artists and the artists are the young people. And so I go there first. I don't tend to go to the president or to Congress or to my deans or uh, 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 other folks who are, who are very powerful. I tend to go to um, the people who are closest, as my friend Brian Stevenson says, the people who are most proximate to the pain an injustice, but also the possibility of a better world. Let me ask you this. In 2010, with John McMillan, you edited Protest Nation, words that inspired a century of American radicalism, which was pretty much a fantastic compendium of the most significant, brilliant examples of American radical writing. This is 10 years ago. Yeah. These days, we have social media. Yeah. And I know this is perhaps a very unfair question to ask you, Tim, because I know you are a historian, as you said, historians need time for stuff to, you know, for now to become history. Yeah. But given so there is so much radical thinking and radical writing 
being created in 280 characters on Twitter. <laughs> do you think do you think this is a power for good, the mass media of social media? Or is it such a febrile environment that actually it's just white noise and it takes a lot to rise above it? I think it's both. I think it's all those things. I think that, um, you know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, these other social media platforms have profoundly transformed our culture. We're all producers, consumers, and circulators of news and opinion now. And that's incredibly democratizing. It's also chaos. And democracy is messy, so I can always sort of embrace and hold a certain amount of chaos in, in, in place at one time. Um, and I think that you know, it depends on how it's used. I think that um, on the one hand, we see social media as what my friend Josh Tucker at NYU has called a liberation technology. Yes. Right? These social media platforms are, are incredibly democratized and they allow people to get information out and organize very quickly and speak truth to power and all of these things that, that, that liberation people do, right? That the dissent folks are engaged in. And it can be powerful. We've seen it power, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And yet it's also, as he says, a repression technology, hmm. right? A technology that's being abused, that's being infiltrated, that's being that can be the spreader of fake news and of conspiracy theories and um, mechanisms of surveillance and so forth. So I think it's all of those things. And that's been true of other technologies as well. Every social movement that I can think of in the United States has used the technologies available to them and technological advances uh, to make their case, to, to, to argue their 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 demands and to to organize themselves. So the abolitionists made incredibly powerful use of of techno of 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 sophi more sophisticated print culture, the rise of photography, right, yeah. to document, to tell stories, and so forth. But print culture, newspapers, photographs have also been used in really negative ways. Think about radio, right? Radio can be a powerful technology. FDR used the radio for fireside chats and wanted to get closer to the people during a time of pain. But we also see right-wing talk radio has poisoned the culture of America in so many ways. And yet it's also been used uh, to, to do all sorts of wonderful things. The podcast revolution is an example of that. And so just like those previous technologies, 24-hour news, right, is a great thing in some ways, and it's a terrible thing in other ways. And so every type of, of technology at every moment, inflection point in American history has been used for good and for bad. So I think it's, it's how it's used. But there's no question that social media platforms have completely changed how we do everything. Right? I mean, you look at the news right now, every single news segment references a tweet or a post or an Instagram account, or something. I mean, in some ways, social media is is leading, uh, and we're we're all trying to keep up. Exactly. Uh, we don't have long. There are two books more I would like to talk to you about, albeit perhaps briefly. And I apologise for the brevity. Sure. But in 2012, you published the Indispensable Zin, um, which is focused on the work of Howard Zinn. Uh, it's got an introduction from um, his former Spelman College student and longtime friend Alice Walker. And a fantastic afterword by Zinn's friend and colleague Noam Chomsky, who wrote, um, when well, it was known that wrote that uh, uh, work changed the way his work, uh, that Zinn's work changed the way millions of people saw the past. For those such as I, and I put my hand up to this, who were hitherto unfamiliar with the work of Howard Zinn, how did his work change the way millions of people saw the past? Well, Howard Zinn was one of those revolutionary thinkers, those historians who were really pushing to up and, and, and do away with those master narratives. And so A People's History of the United States, which is probably his most famous book, although he published dozens of books, um, was a history from the bottom up. It was, in a way, Eric Foner, my advisor from graduate school, reviewed A People's History in the New York Times, and he said that A People's History by Howard Zinn is, in, its, in essence, like the photographic negative 
of the master narrative, right? When you have a photo, a, a picture and a negative, it just flipped the script. And so instead of telling the history of America through the elites, the generals and the presidents and the captains of industry, he told the story of American history through the workers, the women and African-Americans and enslaved people and immigrants and other folks who had not yet gotten their due as part of the um, engine of the nation. And so um, so it, it really powerfully changed how we think about it. It upended it, it flipped the script. But one thing that's very interesting is that the time I published the book, one of the things that I found out was that a people's history of the United States sold more copies every single year since its original publication in 1980 than, than, than to the year before. So every year mm-hmm. of its existence, it sold more copies the next year. And it's the best-selling history book in the history of history books. Right. And so it's powerfully affected how my generation understands history. He wasn't the only one who did this, but he did it most popularly and probably most impactfully. Uh, and it's, it's been taught high schools. And so in some ways, it's bridged the gap between what sometimes is academic scholarship that stays in the academy and the, the, the vast kind of democratic understanding of history that we get in schools and public schools and the public sphere. And so Howard was keenly interested in bridging that divide. He, he, he tried to do that and he did it powerfully. And that's um, one reason why his work is so, so important. He also lived the values that he valued in others that he wrote about, that he was also an activist. He was also on the front lines of the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam war movement, and so many other social justice movements. And so when I got to meet him in the late 1990s, when I moved to Boston for the um, first time after graduate school, actually during graduate school, um, he was someone that I, I saw as a kind of beacon, as someone who was a very serious scholar and researcher and historian, but also someone who was walking the walk in the world. And that was a model of how I wanted to live my own life as a scholar and a teacher, an activist and a citizen. What do you think Zinn would make of these times now? Because there are great parallels with what was happening in the 80s, but perhaps with a different perspective. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting you would ask me this question because I, I mentioned before, I'm, I just turned 49. I'll be 50 next year. I, I just finished my 25th year of teaching. I just finished my fifth book. I'm, I'm taking stock. I mean, <laughs> what else can you do in a global pandemic, I suppose, uh, and the world historical moment, but reflect on the life you've led and what else you have to do. And I often think, uh, about what Howard would say to me right now. And I, I miss him terribly. And Manny Marable, my other, one of my other mentors, who's passed way too early. Um, so many of the elders, the people who inspired me to live the life that I live, even my parents are getting older, have gone or, or are older and, and aging. And so I have a lot of these imaginary conversations with these folks to try to go back to their reading all the time, their writings all the time. And Howard, I think, would be delighted in some ways by what's happening now, this renaissance of radical uh, activism in America. He'd be right out there with everybody, I think, uh, or I know. He'd be writing about it. He'd be delighted by the Black Lives Matter movement. He'd be delighted by these young people. He also had deep faith in what young people could offer the world in terms of a model for dissent. And artists too, part of the reason why I am so drawn to young people and to artists, I think is in part due to Howard's influence. And so I think he would, he would worry profoundly as he always did about the rising expressions and architectures of authoritarianism. He would worry profoundly about the vast inequalities in our society, the violence that pervades so much of who we are and how we go about things in the world. But he would find hope in these new expressions of dissent. Uh, I think he would say that our democracy is at once precarious and under threat, and it's alive and well and flowing in the direction of justice. And I hope that's what he'd say. That's certainly how I imagine our conversation going. And maybe it's 
more for me than for him that I need those reminders because if we descend into despair, which Howard always resisted as fiercely as anything else he resisted in his life, then we become paralyzed and part of us dies and we can't allow that to happen. We have to you know, keep hope alive um, so that justice can flow and democracy can survive. And um, he gave us a roadmap for that, not just in his writings and his teachings, but in his life. Well, that's very elegantly put. Thank you. You Obviously, Joe Biden is running as a presidential candidate in the um, elections in November. He has yet to choose a, uh, a VP. I'm not going to ask you who you hope he chooses. But were you sitting, were you playing, if you were to play the same role with Biden that you did with Barack Obama, what's the one serious piece of counsel that you would, you, you would, you would give to him? <laughs> my first impulse is to say don't f this up <laughs> <laughs> that's a good start point tim it's a very good start i gave you a, a pg-13 version of that that would be no, the first we're thing happy to run with that what would the second point be <laughs> stick, to the, stick to the script and do not screw this up he's a he's a portal to a different kind of america away from this crisis that we're in now with trump the more well, that is serious. I would say that to him, but I, I would say more substantively, don't sell out. What does that mean? He has been pushed over his career as he was vice president with President Obama, and most recently by this renaissance of yep. radicalism and progressive activism that we are seeing in America. He's been pushed left. He's saying things now and embracing policies now and making promises now that are so much more progressive than anything that he's ever said or done in his career, although there are hints of it at different places. Um, and this is a time for the Democratic Party to embrace those progressive values and enact progressive policies. That one thing I worry about with the Democratic Party, and we're a two-party system, and that's not going to change anytime soon. And I lament that fact. I wish that we had a much different kind of robust democratic political system, but we don't. We have a two-party system. So as long as we have that, I worry that too often the Democratic Party is where great social movements go to die because there's nowhere else to go in our political system. If you are someone who cares about justice and rights and human dignity, freedom and equality, the Republicans are not your place. So there's only one option if you go within our system. And so the Democrats are it. And too often they have taken advantage of that, that they absorb the energy of these much more robust, small d democratic expressions and they sort of take pieces of it, make promises, and then it loses its luster and its energy. And Biden has an opportunity now at the very end of his career and probably life, he's not young, to be a portal to a much more democratic, much more progressive, much more inclusive and egalitarian America. To, to literally reimagine America so it can be reborn into the thing that it always said it was and it's always promised it would be someday. Because I think that this election, I, I'm being dramatic here, but I'll say it anyway. I think this is our last shot. Really? I don't think America's got a future. With a, with a Trump second term. With a Trump second term. Every institution in our society is under assault. Yeah. And if the forces, if the, the better angels of our nature and nation don't win this time, I worry that we're dying a slow and painful death. And so that's what I'd say to Joe Biden. Now is your moment, brother. History has met you. You've always wanted this. Don't screw it up. There is a tide in the affairs of men. Be the portal to yeah. a different world and a new America. Any chance of Hillary as VP? No, absolutely not. And, uh, and it, it shouldn't be. Um, I am 
thrilled that he made the promise that he's going to pick a woman as his running mate. And I'm even more thrilled that he's going to deliver on that. That's a good sign. The fact that he's probably most likely going to pick an African-American woman or a woman of color um, is important because let's be honest, if the Democrats win, and they, we, you know, we can vanquish this Trump and Trumpist moment. Um, Joe Biden could very well be picking the first woman president of the United States. Just the hot, not just his way. vice president, but the first woman to become president of the United States at some point in the near future. And that is not an insignificant thing. That's a profound thing, and I hope he gets it right. He's got wonderful people to choose from. I supported in the primary Elizabeth Warren, who's my senator, a very progressive woman. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that she has a brilliant future and will probably have a role to play in the administration. Uh, but I really hope that he picks an African-American woman. It's time. It's long been time. Um, he has wonderful people to choose from, and I think it's going to be an exciting moment when that happens. I mean, they, it's it's an awful thing to say, but of course, if Biden were to win, he would be taking on the presidency at an older age that Reagan left it in. Right. Um, and you know, the old adage is, for the VP, you're just a heart weight away from the levers of power. What an extraordinary turn of events it would be to go from a Trump president to a Biden to a a, a black African American female VP who then becomes presidency. Yeah. That would be. That would be a hell of a turnaround. That would be quite something, but we're in the age of quite some things, aren't we? We can, but dream. Last thing, Tim, and you've been very generous with your answers, and I'm sorry to, sorry to take so much of your time, but I am given to understand, a little bit has told me, you are close to finishing a manuscript, uh, and I understand the working title includes the words Stonewall and Children. What? I, don't, I hate doing this to writers that haven't finished a manuscript, but... Can you tell us anything about what you are working on and when we might expect it? Yes. So the, the book is called Stonewall Children, Living Queer History in an Age of Liberation, Loss, and Love. And it, it's a book that I uh, started in some ways um, at the 40th anniversary of Stonewall 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. I gave a lecture. I was invited to give a lecture, and I, I gave a lecture called Stonewall's Children. Uh, my editor and publisher thought that the lecture was good and said, hey, you should turn this into a book. And so I started to you know, fuss around and they gave me a, 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 a contract and I worked on it in fits and starts. And interestingly, that was 2009. And here we are in 2020. Um, much has happened in queer history over the lived experience of the last 10 or 11 years. And now we're one year after the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. The book is finally, um, I think, done. <laughs> and uh, so I'm putting final, uh, final edits on it. It's not a children's book, uh, although I hope a lot of young people will read it. It's a book that seeks to show how, for those of us who identify as LGBTQ people, um, how we come to understand our history and how we navigate living through historic times. And so the book kind of takes that up. It's, it's part history, it's part memoir autobiography, and it's part political essay. I'm calling it a, a queer autobio history. <laughs> so it's a, it's a genre bending book in some ways, um, deeply rooted in history, of course, um, but it kind of takes up um, how queer people especially kind of come to understand themselves while they're trying to live that history simultaneously. And it also tries in a way to think about generational differences and continuities. It tries to meditate on the progress that has been made, certainly, but also what I call the paradox of progress, which is um, both the kind of reaction that so fiercely comes sometimes in the face of progress, and we see this in all different uh, groups that have been disadvantaged and disenfranchised in some way, but so often those moments of progress come with fierce reaction and sometimes even violence. And so that's part of the paradox, is that just when you achieve something, you have to fight to keep it. And there's also a paradox in this progress in that sometimes the advancement of rights for some people within a group come at the expense of leaving behind other people in that group. And that has been true of the LGBTQ community. And so I'm 
taking up that in the second part of the book where I try to really think about the people in our own community and our own movement and our own society who are most vulnerable. And how can we imagine a new kind of politics of queer liberation that doesn't leave anyone behind, that, that moves us into a world that is more free and more equal and more dignified, um, but that leaves no one behind. And so the book takes up all of that, and it begin. And in, in some ways, it's a love letter. The the book begins with a love letter to elders, uh, a love letter to, in particular, Walt Whitman and James Baldwin, and Sylvia Rivera and June Jordan and Audre Lord and Harvey Milk. It's a long love letter to the elders who came before me. Some of them, all of them, and then it ends with a love letter to my niece, who is ten years old, an African American kid. Um, really interesting, kind of gender bendy, wonderful young person who I love fiercely and who I worry about deeply because she's going to inherit this world. And so the whole book is a kind of love letter to queer people, a love letter to my chosen family, a love letter to the history of the country told from a particular lens. And so I hope that it will help to illuminate all those things. But most of all, I hope that what it gives to the world is a, a jolt of love. Because as my dear friend Cornel West likes to say, love is what, uh, justice is what love looks like in public. You know what you've just done there, Tim? You know what you've just done? What'd you say? You know what you've just done there, Tim? What? You've just given the perfect, perfect illustration of why you were twice named Professor of the Year by Harvard Crimson. Fantastic. We've had 47 minutes of a 35 minute show. Wonderful. So there's one last thing I would like you to do. If you would be brief, I'd be very grateful. Can you tell us why you are such a strong supporter of the Boxer Diversity Initiative? Oh, the Boxer Diversity Initiative is amazing. I love Dan and Litton Boxer. They are visionary leaders. They are based in Sarasota, where my parents currently live after moving from New York down to Florida. And so they become my parents' friends. And anything they ask me to do to further the values and the work that they do, I say yes to because they've become dear friends and they're agents of great good in this world. Timothy Patrick McCarthy, thank you so much for coming to join us today. I've been very moved by a lot of what you've said. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I know that you are horrendously busy with faculty responsibilities in your own writing. We very much appreciate the fact that you took the time to come and join us here at the Lockdown Lit Fest. Thank you so much, Professor McCarthy. Thanks, Paul. It's been wonderful to be with you. Ladies and gentlemen, there we are. A fine example, should you ever need one, of fierce intelligence worn lightly and a very powerful mode of communication. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've paid attention. I hope you'll go and buy some of the books, not least uh, Timothy's book on Zinn, which is an extraordinary work. And then go and buy Zinn himself if you haven't already. We're very proud to partner with the Boxer Diversity Initiative. We hope you've enjoyed this week of programming and we hope that we'll be able to bring you many more of their fantastic speakers writers and thinkers. But for today, from me and from Professor Timothy Patrick McCarthy, we bid you well, stay safe, take care, and love the people who love you back. Here you.